Slavis Vistu. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm supposed to speak English to the best of my abilities. Uh, I welcome uh, us to, I welcome you to this very important event. Before I forgot, this is a very important formation. Information is that uh, this event, this particular event, has been generously supported by Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Commonwealth of Great Britain, specifically by the program which is Crown Agents in partnership with International Alert and Crown Agents in Ukraine. And this is something which is very important because the thing that now, nowadays experiencing the war is our victory, all the kind of things would be impossible with this generous support. So in the name of the our university, I would like to thank, thank these institutions. And um, I have to chair discussion. This is the first discussion in the, uh, the several events we will keep before the uh, opening of the new academic year. And this discussion is focused on the one particular issue, which is very important. And this is resilience of Ukraine. Uh, my name is Yaroslav Retsak. I'm teaching history at the Ukrainian Catholic University. As you may know well, the history is very much complicated things. So therefore, historians quite often I uh, need to have some kind of simple formula or metaphor to explain a very complicated things. And if nowadays Ukrainian situation could be reduced to one word only, this word is resilience. This is something which is a surprise, lucky surprise to many of us, and for and for our and also for our friends. This is shock for many who didn't believe that Ukraine could stand this kind of war. And also it's nightmare for Putin, which I believe he will be punished for this kind of the his, his miscalculation. I believe that Putin action, Putin decision to, uh, uh, to attack Ukraine was the biggest mistake him, that he made in his life and he will be severely punished and he deserves this kind of punishment. But back to resilience. I believe the resilience is kind of phenomenon that begs explanation. It's very much complicated phenomenon. So therefore, I would like us to focus on this phenomenon. Have a beautiful participant here that will help us to, to, to discuss these issues. And before we proceed, I would like to have a small word about the format. I know it's a very big issue, the, 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 the resilience. I know that's kind of the, provokes some kind of feeling of the, of the, of the pride and, and pathetic words, but I believe that we will avoid this to the best of our abilities. What I'd like that our discussion will have a, some kind of human face. Uh, in our university, we, from, from the very first days of the war, we have initiated a project, the little stories of big war. In this project, we're interviewing circa Two hundreds volunteers, refugees, victims, uh, civic leaders, uh, everyone who is one way or another has affected by the war. But the main idea, we don't want to have a big history of the big war. We have the history with a human face, to read them from below, from below up, not from the from the bottom up, not from the top down. So what I'm trying to say, I would like to the discussion have a kind of based on your personal experience. So uh, before I proceed, let me just introduce uh, our participants. So to my right is Svetlana, Svetlana, Svetlana Heluk. Svetlana is a leader of our uh, law program at the university. Uh, Dmitro Shemenhovsky is our vice rector. He's responsible for, for, for international affairs and for academic development. Uh, Taras Dobko is a new rector of our university. He has a bit of an inauguration lecture today in, the, in two days. And he's still enjoying his life as not a rector, but he'll be introduced as a rector in two days. So welcome our new rector, uh, Yaroslav Pertula, uh, who, is, uh, who is or has been, this is kind of secret, has been discussed later, who is uh, still a dean of the, our probably the best department, the Catalan community, is international uh, IT department. And then we have uh, uh, Anastasia uh, Shiroka. Anastasia, you're a specialist in, in psychology. This will be one of the most important a field that now has to be applied to, 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 to the circumstances. And last but not least, Tarastemo. Tarastemo has a many talents. He is very talented as later, as far as I know, but also he's a 
are really specialists in the theology, and I really believe the theology is something that has to be very badly needed in a situation like that. So my first question is, uh, this is a kind of personal question. I would like to ask each of the participants, how do you experience the first day of the war? Did you have this feeling that this war will be for long? And uh, how would the fact that Ukraine, would you, have you, were you surprised by this kind of, resi or, or, of resilience? Would you expect something, this kind of developers like what they have now? So we'll start with Svetlana, if I may. Thank you. Thank you for giving me opportunity to speak first. And I'm really grateful to be here today. And thank you all of you for coming. It's the best way to, spe to spend nice August evening uh, talking about Ukraine I and resilience. <laughs> so uh, speaking about the experience of the first day of the war, it took me some time to understand what was happening. And for a few hours, the feeling was like I was frozen. It was difficult to anticipate that something so stupid and un unreasonable could happen. Uh, but um, there were no doubts. There were no fear, but clear understanding that I had to do what I had to do. At that moment, it was I had to take care about two things. First of all, I had to take care of safety of my kids, and then I had to stay with my students and fa faculty. Therefore, I took to my kids one backpack and crossed the, board, uh, the border gave my kids to my brother, say goodbye, and I promised them to be back. At that moment, I was not sure whether I would be able to keep that promise. And that it made this moment maybe the hardest moment in my life. But then I crossed the border back to the Ukraine. Polish, Polish border guard told me something like this. Stepani are you crazy? What are you doing? Uh, you have to take opposite direction. Uh, till the end of the day, I was on campus, and uh, say, all things became clear and simple. You had to do what you had to do. Uh, that's all. Uh, whether I had any expe expectations, no. No rational arguments at all. Uh, just irrational face that God loves Ukraine, that's it. It's perfect, thank you. Pan Dmitry, what, 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 what was your experience? It is very similar, so thank you for this question. And actually, now I'm reflecting, like several times about that, and uh, uh, now I'm thinking once more, trying to remember this time, and uh, I would rather say that this was a situation full of ambivalence in thinking. Uh, from the one point of view, uh, Svetlana mentioned that it was like very irrational, and indeed. So my background is conflict studies. I know wars, and I can give you like one thousand of reasons why like do this full-scale invasion was a stupid thing. Nevertheless, uh, it happened. And uh, in conflict theory, when we think about war, uh, we think about some rational applications towards the war, and they're usually calculated. So it was hard like to. Uh, for political scientists and for conflict theorists to, to understand how to measure what is happening in the streets that is really irrational and uh, with irrational actually beginning of this war. And uh, uh, what, what is important in this, in this idea of this ambivalence is that you are trying usually to match the reality with your mind. So, and what is happening in that sense is really uh, the, the need to have a strategy. So my first days were about strategy. And luckily, it sounds to be funny, but a few weeks before, we started a group in Uku thinking about the possibility of war. And I am, was actually the big opponent of this conventional domain of war. Uh, I was saying that we will have a number of the hybrid effects that we already seen since 2014, that there is a much bigger threat in terms of the financial so, security. So you didn't expect this kind of I, I was not expecting the conventional part of war. 
And this is quite important in this uh, in these days and actually to have a plan, even if you don't believe it. So this is my first like um, idea about these first days, and I'm keeping it until now. Even if you don't believe in some situation that could happen, have a plan for that. Have a plan, because there is always a possibility of such things uh, to, to be happening. And actually, the plan that we developed a few weeks before helped a lot, because my first exact hours were just missing calls from Father Rector uh, Bogdan Prah, missing calls from uh, Miroslav Marinovich, who was trying to give a calls, and I had to shut down my phone during the night, receiving all the some messages and, and calls from my, uh, from my family and friends. So my mom called me and saying that the war started. And then I just started calling my colleagues here in Naku and uh, coming here having a plan. So because we subscribed the roles before that and concretely coming here, we had a plan what we need to do. So actually, I should admit, frankly, that is so strange, but I missed this irrational feeling of war just because I had a plan what to do. And to some extent, that helped a lot uh, in terms of psychological resilience and, uh, and survival. So I, I will stop probably here and uh, just do one little follow up. So um, even if you don't believe that something bad could happen, be prepared for that. that that's about training. That's about knowledge, and that's what university is best for preparing for that. So to say, think of the better, or as I would say, uh, yeah, think about the better, uh, but prepare for the worst. Yeah, so it's a realist proverb, but indeed, mm -hmm. sometimes it it helps. Thank you so much. Very impressive, Pan Tarasa, Pan Rector. Um, you know, when when the full scale invasion began, uh, I was taking part in the research internship at the University of Notre Dame. So I was in the US. And uh, there, are th there are three things that actually shattered me, I think, in the first weeks of uh, this uh, war. Uh, you know, following uh, Olena Gijora's up recent apt description, the Noah Ark, I think, is at the outset of Latin, is a um, good image for you know rendering what was going on both inside our minds but also in our outside lives uh, first uh, that in the first weeks of the war i was hunted by a um, feeling of the risk of losing home so in a sense uh, normally we took the fact of having home for granted and suddenly there was like a terror of becoming homeless in a fundamental sense and it was strong and i could even say that i could mm, directly relate to the experience of many ukrainians who you know were leaving their homes behind before the soviet occupation in the last months of world war ii and that there was a clear sense of the tragedy in the classic greek meaning of the word in the very first days of the war. So second, uh, we should remember that whenever Russia occupied any land with the uh, Ukrainian Eastern Catholic population, it led to the destruction of the Ukrainian Catholic Church, its institutions, and its faithful. So if Russia succeeded in the occupation of Ukraine, the Ukrainian Catholic University would, not, would cease to exist. That for sure. So, and with the beginning of the full scale invasion, we had to think uh, even about the worst case scenario. Shall we think about Uku's evacuation you know, to the West? We dismissed it, but it could not come, I could not come to terms even with this thought. It was just painful to think about it. And finally, uh, during the last week of February and first week of March, I somehow started to appreciate the meaning of, uh, I was in the US, of the lyrics of the American anthem. It's called the Star Spangle, Spangle Banner. Uh, I learned the story of Francis Scott Key uh, as a story of the battle for Kyiv. Uh, we could not sleep at nights, waking up like three or four times 
and checking if Kyiv is still free and unoccupied. And we were looking for, uh, I quote, proof through the night that our flag was still there. So if you ask this question, you know, about, uh, you know, the thoughts, doubts, uh, my answer is yes. I, I had some doubts. I was, I was sure that Ukrainians would resist and that we will not surrender. Uh, but I was not sure about uh, if our armed forces have enough military power, military equipment to stop Russians. And I was not sure how the West would respond, um, whether it would dare to severely punish Russia for its barbaric behavior and its total disrespect of international law. I thought they might get, you know, satisfied and just restrict themselves with, you know, sanctions, deep concern, maybe public outrage. And there were reasons to think, you know, uh, this way about possible reaction of the West, West, because I think Putin counted not only on the fact, on, on his belief that, you know, Russia has the second most powerful, you know, army in the world, uh, of course, he counted also, uh, also he counted on the dependence of Europe uh, on Russia's uh, natural resources. Of course, he also had a false belief that Ukraine is artificial and weak state. But I think he also counted very much and expected that the West would acquiesce with the blitzkrieg and occupation of Ukraine. Somehow that the West uh, will be enabled to transcend like its comfort, uh, its attachment to comfort, and to unite, you know, before uh, the threat, uh, the threat from from Russia. Uh, but I must confess that uh, he was not all wrong about it, and somehow this scared me uh, because I understood that without Western weapons and resources, we have uh, little chance to defeat Russians. Maybe, you know, just, of course, to resist, but the question of full defeat, however brave we fight them. So, but thanks to heroism of uh, the Ukrainian, uh, of the Ukrainian people, eventually the tragedy was turning out into a heroic epos, to use Irina Starovoit's uh, metaphor just a few days ago, and this was an achievement of Ukrainian resistance, a strong resilience, and profound hope that I hear uh, relate to what Svetlana said, that God and not Putin is the Lord of history. So finally, this was my strong feeling uh, in the first months of the war. Thank you so much. May I ask you for your presentation? Uh, Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Yaroslav, for inviting uh, for this uh, irre really interesting discussion. Uh, I, I would start uh, not from the time of starting of this big war, but even a few years before that. I have some friends who are really great strategists. So one, let me change it. Uh, one of my friends, he, he mentioned uh, things that will happen a few years before that, and he just thought, uh, talk, are you, do you want to kind of go out and uh, uh, experience that war from outside? Another friend said me that a month before the invasion, uh, full-scale invasion, and asked the same, gave really great reasons and asked the same question. And uh, on the family meeting, we decided we, we stay. So it was not a question uh, that we should ask ourselves whenever it, it, this full-scale invasion starts. So uh, we wake, woke up uh, at that early morning. Uh, so no, no question what to do. We stay. Uh, and I started my uh, morning with messaging to, 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 to our students. Uh, so first message uh, or war communication uh, started at s about 7 a.m. Uh, when first explosions we heard a few hours before that. Uh, uh, I wrote, keep calm. 
uh, help yourself and wait for, for the next communication. Uh, but what happened next day, uh, we started a new group uh, in our communication channel uh, with our students. This was a group, how to support Ukraine. And uh, indeed, our feelings, they resulted in doings. And we start lot, we start, we, we, we created a kind of network hub where there were several f faculty uh, fellows. We sit from the very uh, morning to the late evening, just gathering information, transferring information to those who might need it, uh, who look for people to do something, who look to, uh, for, uh, who had some ideas and need IT guys to realize that uh, idea. And I think within the first few days, uh, we created, uh, I think, about 10 startups. Uh, some of them lasted for a year or more uh, that were devoted to, to the issues to help uh, Ukrainians to, 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 uh, to survive in that war. Uh, either it was a chatbot, how to get from Eastern Ukraine to, to the Western Ukraine, because Main roads were blocked. Uh, there are no fuel in, in many uh, fuel stations, so you need to figure out how to, how to drive. Uh, whether it was a, another chatbot for those who escaped Ukraine, and uh, pupils needed to have online uh, lessons in Ukraine, but because there were different time time uh, zones, but the schedule was only in Ukrainian zone, so. Uh, many were confused what is the starting time, for example. So uh, there was a really popular app how to, uh, to that help uh, people to find his or her class uh, and uh, start studying earlier than it might happen in different circumstances. There were several projects uh, about uh, fighting fake news, uh, IPSO, as we call it. Uh, one of the most famous, I think, UKU project about Stop the War project uh, that was started with an idea that was thrown to our group and then Oleksii Molchanovsky and Maria Tetarenko uh, start developing that and it, they made the project with news that were translated in tens of languages for, for, to, for local populations and countries to consume the truth of the war. Uh, so, in, the, in about a week, we created our cybersecurity group, our 3D printing group, and other groups that we'll talk about after the victory. And uh, it was everything about doing what we can do uh, to make Ukraine uh, defend itself. Uh, and uh, if talking about what I felt that time, I think uh, when saw our students that made enormous work, uh, that made 24 hours uh, shifts to, to, to make the process of, uh, uh, say, production or uh, making these IT products workable all day and night, uh, I saw that this is a sign that we'll survive and uh, victory will be on our side. Thank you so much. Your experience must be particularly interesting because you're a psychologist and you could yeah. so say this kind of <laughs> very sound distance. What to start, yes, yeah, so here we represent uh, uh, as a psychologist, also as a researcher and as a mother of three <laughs> kids. So for me, it was quite similar experiences for Svetlana uh, that since the beginning of war and for me it begins from the, non, from the message from our teacher of one of my child that it is the war and the school is closed and you need something to do but you don't know what <laughs> just something new, new reality in, interrupted in your life uh, and as I remember I just turn off all my feelings and it just bec become a calm mind <laughs> Because if you uh, take care of children, if you take care of students, you just can't, you know, have a lot of painful feelings and emotion and etc. And I think it's just for me, it was a turning point with my 
personal resilience starts to grow up. Uh, and what uh, I do further for my kids and for students, uh, I was uh, experience how we all stay in one line, you know, and you can't disappear from this line because everyone noticed this disappearing. And for them, it will be a very strong message that something goes wrong. You need to stay and you need to translate message that everything okay, we will survive, we will resist. And uh, it's one thing and another, uh, for me, it was very important is that we, uh, since the first uh, days of war, we organized a lot of meetings in our department with our students. And it was not like an ordinary schedule that we normally have with lectures. It was once a day, a big meeting where everyone participate when we have some topics to discuss. And the most important thing was to create the safe space where everyone can feel um, feel their self, their start thinking, start to process their emotions and other painful experience just to be here and now. And I remember uh, that I was invited to have some speech for the Q, Q, Q community and other, and was one of my messages that time was that we shouldn't uh, think much about past or about future because it is too painful and we need to survive now and not to have so much pain you know like just to be here and now and to do what we can do on our places uh, and i think that it was the most reasonable thing that we can do that time uh, and the more atrocities actually we faced because they start to um, to to uh, occur the messages of mass murders, of rapes, of uh, demolishing uh, uh, houses, of missile attacks, and etc. It was every every day of our reality. Uh, and the more, the stronger I become in my belief that we need to resist, and we do even more than we do now. Uh, so and. Uh, and I think we create this space and then amazing things start happened. That people start to organize themselves, themselves and to do the best what they can do. Some uh, start to organize um, uh, counseling uh, services. Uh, some work with Instagram pages to provide uh, information of self-help, of psychological support and etc. which might be needed for other people to uh, to to um, to have some skills, you know, to to f calm down, uh, and etc. Uh, and some were um, involved in helping around at Lviv shelters because it was a time when a lot of refugee communities start to come to Lviv, and they mainly was in different shelters. And one of the shelters actually was in Yuku also uh, so they need uh, professional help and our students our teachers and everyone uh, who can help what was there some of our uh, faculties especially those who work as a, in rehabilitation and uh, uh, clinical uh, services they start to help around the hospitals uh, as a teams with injured people uh, and etc. So everyone start to feel what they can do best and just provide the services. And I think that it's very important, uh, important moment where we, it's absolutely true that we all feel injured and traumatized by what is going on, but also we start to build up like new skin or something that make us stronger and stronger every day. Thank you so much. Panatarasi, you could you share your experience with you, please? Thank you. Um, well, as everyone else, I was, uh, I think my uh, prevalent emotion in the first days of the war was obviously stress. Uh, but I would say also balanced stress <laughs> because um, uh, we have a large family. I have five children and also my mother who is handicapped. She lives with us. So uh, we thought the logistic effort of leaving the country is much bigger than the chance that Russians will get very quickly to Lviv. So we decided once they 
they cross Zbruch River, we will probably go to Poland, but not before that. And luckily they haven't so far, so we, are, we, we stayed. Um, we filled our time mostly with uh, intensive help with whatever we could. Uh, I started to record the videos for, for my uh, friends from, from the English-speaking world, informing from at the grass roots level what's happening in Lviv because people were emailing, uh, texting, asking questions, uh, how we are and generally what is the situation. So I, uh, that was something I found like a channeling of my anxiety into, into things to do. Uh, my older children started to help uh, as a part of stu UKU student organization and part of the PLAST scouting organization uh, helping their friends in the army and um, I think part of the resilience was not, not maybe not part of it but really the heart of the resilience of Ukrainian people uh, lays at the grassroots level uh, where ordinary people started donating money started organizing little volunteer projects and organizations um, going to the army. I had a number of friends who enlisted in the first day uh, of the war immediately uh, and so on. And one, Taras has already mentioned this battle um, for Kyiv and uh, there was this wonderful article, very detailed article, I think in the Washington Post about the whole s uh, defense on, of Kyiv and uh, uh, one episode which was the most striking for me was uh, this young recruit in um, the Hostomel airport who was really not prepared for anything like that. He was just a, a, a soldier of Strokovi uh, Slushba, just young soldier of 20 years of age and he has never handled this uh, complex anti-aircraft systems. So when the helicopters were landing, he, he shot, he made one shot, it didn't reach the target, and then he was almost killed by the fire from the helicopter, but he managed to fire a second shot. And he actually brought down the helicopter that was reputedly like un, unreachable uh, target for, for anything because this is like super sophisticated helicopter with uh, all the an anti-rocket systems on it. And then, so due to the fact that he brought down this first helicopter, other soldiers started shooting and br bringing down other helicopters and that's what actually saved the airport <laughs> and probably saved the city. Uh, so the power of person in history, this, this particular uh, young recruit, I think he, he is maybe unintentionally, but like a superhero of the of the defense of of Kyiv. But that also shows you the the price of of human faith and effort. So once you you do something like that, it can really change change history. And I think there were many many more people uh, like this in Ukraine in the first days of the war. Not all of them so prominent, obviously, as as this fighter, but but many. Uh, second thing, as a, as a theologian, I was really struck with, uh, we prayed, so of course, as just natural response of people who believe in God was to pray. And uh, people who know me know I'm, that I'm a big fan of biblical psalms. And uh, the texts of psalms were always criticized by, by historians by theologians in the 20th century in the luxury of study rooms that sometimes psalms are too cruel, too bloody. They reflect this ancient Near Eastern cruelty, cursing enemies and, you know, wishing death to the enemies. But in, in the first days of the war, until today, I think, it's uh, when you read psalms, you, 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 really try to, you really start to understand why it was like this, uh, and why these texts are not just like cruel, immoral cruelty of ancient people, but they are something that uh, is appropriate for the situation because history is not linear. Maybe it's it depends on the on the uh, 
difficulty of the situation, if your enemies in the 20th, first century are just as barbaric as some Assyrians or Babylonians in 15th century BC, the response to, to, to the, the barbarism is, has to be the same as, as it was uh, in that time. So the, the power of the word of God is sometimes surprising for us because we thought it's outdated. These are outdated texts uh, of religious history, but I think they remain uh, quite eloquent, quite appropriate for, for our experiences sometimes, unfortunately. Thank you so much. I would say very fortunately because it reflects the, this kind of the, our topic of resilience. Let me just share briefly my own experience. I believe the very beginning of war there were two groups in the Unionist which were all presented. First refugees and the second was foreign journalists. Each of them tried to make interviews with anyone who had the code. And I remember one particular moment which I never shared with anybody. There was a group of American journalists. They came to, to make a, some kind of short video there, and they were interviewing me. And that guy, they, 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 they ceased to interview because they received some call, and they told me in a secret that they get a message from American ambassador, ambassador in Kyiv that they expect an attack from the north, uh, Ukraine, the Russian border, and the Russian army is supposed to be in Lviv in four hours. And they were suggested to evacuate as far as, 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 as soon as possible, see what they did. And they make me a favor, they just to tell me in secret that we have to do something. And I called Miroslav Senek, our vice rector. And he called somebody who was there in the front. I said, keep calm, this is misinformation. What I'm saying, this kind of connection, the kind of network of the, of the information, of the knowledge, of everything, so to say. In a sense, uh, we were, I, I'm talking about personally, but I believe this is the, the, the experience that Sharo was, we are kind of privileged to be in this university. It's a kind of network. And have experience of the first Maidan, the second Maidan, uh, we kind of experience what to deal with that. And therefore, I believe there's something which is, should be written about the history of this university about after the war. But before, uh, before the war ends, we have to discuss this particular situation. And I believe that Ukraine is a kind of miraculous country because it shows something which was quite unexpected. Uh, you, all of us know this kind of stereotypical image of Ukraine as a very corrupted country, uh, kind of the failed state, with a society deeply divided, all the kind of things. Basically, to put it simply, nobody thought that Ukraine could resist, for a long time at least. I know that, I know for some kind of uh, for some kind of information that I got from outside that what was expected uh, from the United States uh, experts that Ukraine would fail in the first wall, but there will partisan war start. And this the partisan war would, def would define the future of the country. So this is, this is the, the strategy. Luckily enough, they were wrong. So my question is, not question, what I'm saying here that the was surprising for me, the level of solidarity. It's not just Ukraine started to trust each other. Just think for a moment. For the first time in Ukraine, in the history, history of Ukraine independence, Ukrainians started to trust their own government. It's without precedent. It's a kind of irony. It takes a war to have a trust between society, society and uh, state. This is. Uh, a very important precondition to change the country in the future. So my question is, or not question, probably something should discuss. We have this kind of resilience, which is unbelievable, which is very kind of the impress of the kind of things. But how to transform this resilience in sustainability, in sustainable development, not just in ecological terms, but instead something that Ukraine not just couldn't survive, but say, become a new kind of country, uh, which will say, define, to a large extent, the future of Europe and the future of the war. And I would like you to share with this kind of the, your thought about that, specifically taking account the traumas we already had. So my issue is, my question is, how we should minimize this trauma to turn this kind of traumas, to turn this resilience in the future sustainability. So, Pani CMA, start with you this time. Yeah. It's good because I have <laughs> something to tell you. I know uh, you have something to tell. Uh, 
yeah um yeah and i guess uh, uh, that uh, we need to talk about trauma and about resiliency both things because both things here are very important to understand and when we talk about tra traumatic experience i'm as a researcher can tell that we uh, from time to time ask people what you see what you experience uh, what war um, uh, events you you faced in, in your life and we understand that it is a huge amount of trauma that uh, among for example re uh, refugee uh, or displaced communities uh, almost uh, half uh, have experienced four and more traumatic events uh, and uh, for for NGOs, for example, and volunteers, uh, it's even higher number. So if we, um, of course, we work with a small uh, samples, but we can I only imagine that this uh, number uh, it is in millions of people who who see the things that uh, and experience the things that people normally do not experience. Uh, and this is uh, a part of our identity, I guess. But it's only the part. Uh, and this tra traumatized part, uh, it will need uh, a special care. Uh, and what we know from other researchers is that, yes, it is true that traumatic experience uh, have a in intergenerational nature, so it can go to uh, to our next generations uh, and uh, that's why that's why we need to to consider this uh, and what uh, trauma needs it needs to be spelled so it needs uh, uh, to have a voice uh, and uh, this voice needs to be heard in a compassionate and safe manner it's very important and it, I think that it is something that we will do um, especially after the war finished because now uh, it's very painful to talk a lot about trauma but from my experience there are people who are ready to share this experience and we need to be uh, very very protective about and to create very safe spaces that this experience can have a place uh, and also what trauma also needs it needs cultural rituals and also that it's something that we will need created years after uh, after it that uh, we have some uh, cultural events where people can can unburden the self unburden uh, those that they, they, they almost each of us bring inside um, but it, as I said, mentioned, that it's also only the half of the story. The other half of the story is that how resilient we are and uh, uh, what uh, strong features we possess. Uh, and uh, like uh, self determination, like uh, 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 love to the country and care about the people who live here and want to bring as much hope and, uh, and compassion to, to, to people that are around. Uh, and uh, this experience as a researcher, I can't tell much because it's, there are not ma many studies that uh, can uh, tell us about how this part of experience will translate into generation. What we exactly know is that, of course, uh, uh, the more our children will know about our resistance or about um, what we do and how we experience the time and what brave we were and what sense of what uh, um, values was important for us, the more than they can take from us and do something uh, in their life. And it is very important that our children understand that there are a lot of things that depends on them that they need to stay active, proactive, socially, politically active, that's everything possible. Even in the situation that no one believes that it is possible. And it's one of the features that we can bring as to other children and to the world as a whole. Thank you. Talking about the studies, uh, I have a friend who is an American psychologist. He stays in the Eastern Europe for 30 years. He's not young anymore. 
He started with the support for the Soviet dissidents uh, in psychiatry. So he uh, shared with me a recent study uh, on the British veterans uh, from Afghanistan and Iraq. And what he says is basically they are the study that uh, some 14, 15 percent of them right after the war landed in the prison for right of the crimes they did, committed, as a result of the trauma of the war. It says basically it's psychological trauma which could, you could hardly avoid, you should be prepared for that. So this is again my question is, uh, we're talking about persistence, we're talking about resilience, but there's a trauma. It's a personal trauma, it's also a social trauma, so to say. So how we should deal with that, and uh, probably Pan Mitrov would be the next one as a strategist. You know the strategy, you probably know the... And maybe I, I will add a little. Uh, please do, please do, please do. <laughs> I think uh, that I'm strongly passionate about. I think that we need to provide as much as possible trauma-informed care and trauma-informed approach in every possible uh, um, social... Um, uh, like you know, trauma-informed care in hospitals, in schools, mm -hmm. in police offices, and etc. Because as much people know about trauma and how she, um, uh, how she is in people, uh, proceed uh, the more they can uh, create uh, environment for more people to stay in the safe environment and to heal their traumas. Uh, and to, to understand that it's nothing bad, something bad about themselves. Mm -hmm. Because many people, after traumatic experience, suppose that they're insane and that there's something wrong with that, that, them. And it's very important to that they and people around understand that it is their prehistory, it's something that they go through. And uh, they're not obliged to stay with this experience for the rest of their life. I see. Yeah, thank okay. you so much. Parameter Mary. Okay, got it. So it's quite a difficult question for, uh, from the viewpoint of social sciences. But uh, when we are talking with with my colleagues, so usually we are coming to the idea that in social perspective, if you're talking about resilience, resilience is the matter of having extra resources. So when you have something hidden in your pocket, extra that is not obliged you to 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 have with you at the, at the some period of time, but also a matter of behavior. That you have its culture, in your culture of practicing, of getting your hand into the pocket and bringing something extra. So the, the, these two features usually, usually are playing a great role. And when we are talking, for example, uh, uh, I'm I'm just like trying to simplify these things definitely. But in general, so psychologists can can talk a lot like about the ability, personal ability, like to calm your amygdala, because usually this is this is that. Uh, that kind of things when, when you're trying to calm your amygdala and put your critical mind to actually to act, to plan. So it's, it's so difficult when you're trauma, traumatized. So it's just coming down your emotions. But in social way, it's, it's having something extra. And when we are talking about the stories, we are definitely coming to the idea that uh, one of the most successful reforms that we call decentralization reform helped a lot for our social body. Because it's uh, definitely help people to understand that they have property. For the hundreds of years, being a part of empires, Ukrainians were lacking of property. So, and that habit of having property and being responsible for your property, to some extent, is what Ukrainians are lacking. And here, with the decentralization of form, even in the small villages, especially the villages are uh, closer to the front line, people suddenly turned out that this is not communal property. This house, this land, this territory, these people are the property of their own, so they're responsible for that. And decentralization plays a great role, so people understood that they have something to fight. And then if we are thinking about the resilience in the social terms, we are coming to that social and political terms, to that idea that this habit of being responsible can play a great role. And if we are thinking about the future, that is two conditions that should be kept in as Ukrainian habit. Like having these extra resources 
And by having these extra resources, in any case, have the strategic planning, simply means that we should rely on good governance, that we should rely on the strong institutional building, and we should rely on ourselves as the active civil players or active political players. Because by good governance, we create extra resources. With bad governance, we are simply doing what economists call misallocated capital. We are losing the possibility to invest money properly in the cases where they are needed. We are wasting them. So this is about these extra resources. But also having that in a habit. Having resilience as a habit. So we are thinking, we are talking about the personal experience in the coup, and I told you at the first, answering the first question why, why uh, I had ambivalent situation and ambivalent thinking, because we had a plan, because we were prepared. Because keep in mind that previous years of the revolution of dignity, the previous years of the Orange Revolution, the previous years of COVID, and having a number of different actions that were repeatedly continuing establish us the clear vision how to act. So we practice that. And we practice that not only in the independent Ukraine. Actually, frankly speaking, I'm, I'm not historian, so probably Professor Herzak will allow to, to say that I'm completely wrong, completely wrong, but today, talk, uh, if we put our resources like a basis of thinking, we are at the best conditions ever. This situation is of the Russian full-scale invasion is not the new one. It's, it's happening for centuries, it's happening for ages. But today we have our army, today we have our country, today we have our international support, today we have the clear people from different parts of the world that, that have this feeling of solidarity with Ukraine and are ready to vote and to, are ready to, to pay extra to help Ukraine. Definitely there are people who contradict this, but, but still, we don't have this, like 100 years ago. We have our people who are governing, we have our banking system that is, that is ready. We have everything that we didn't have even like 30 years ago. We have it right now. So this is about creation of the extra resources and have this culture of practicing uh, correctly these this extras. And uh, I don't have the simple answer to this question, so what we should do? But I'm thinking that the two important steps that we need to do is taking our personal responsibility for our future and trying to do the good governance in whatever you are taking. So if, if you would like to go to the public administration or you just want to uh, do some great research or you just want to help other people uh, because you're practicing with rehabilitation or psychological or mental care, so try to do the good governance. Try to invest your time, your skills, your money, your resources to do the profit, like in the literally thinking, and not to waste this time. So I think that this is a basis of the social action that indeed can help us to have more and more resources in the future because I'm skeptical one that this war will end when we stop fighting and have the peaceful agreement. Thank you so much. Pani Svetlano, uh, Metro mentioned several times good governance. And you're probably close to that because your field is uh, law. So where are we now with the, with, during the war with this good, good governance, our chances to have a kind of sustainable reforms is in, in, which is very much needed exactly at this time? Uh, we are on our way. <laughs> 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 yeah, in the process. <laughs> uh, which is good news, because at least we try our best. But there are also probably bad, good, bad, bad news as well. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, so I think that our problem is that uh, we have uh, too many teenagers uh, among decision makers and policy makers, and we need more adults uh, to have difficult conversation, to ask difficult questions, and, and to make difficult and popular decisions. So we need them. Uh, and as a university, it's our task to provide such adults to make changes in our, uh, in our social life. And uh, speaking about this trauma experience, uh, I think that uh, I think this is essential point for, for the social level 
especially in terms of, of good governments, trauma could be explanation of our situation, of the situation where we are. But our collective trauma could not be an excuse that we are sitting and doing nothing. Uh, and so this proper attitude to the trauma also is one of the preconditions of our further success in building sustainable institutions. And um, one more thing as a lawyer I would like to pay attention to is um, that to overcome trauma, both on the personal and social level, we need justice. Uh, before joining uh, Ukrainian Catholic University, I uh, practiced as a lawyer for uh, and represented for, for tw 12 years, I had been representing victims of crimes. And what was important for all those people to went through their difficult experience, for them was crucially important to know that uh, those who committed a crime would be punished, and the crime would be named by its name, and that at least something has changed, that their laws would help someone else to escape the same suffering. And I think that uh, this justice issue are also very important for us, both on personal level and social level and even on international level to build a sustainable communities, local communities, to build sustainable national institu institutions and to restart some international security mechanism. Thank you so much. I've been told, I've been told at the beginning of this year that the number of registered crime, war crimes in Ukraine is that big that no, no court could deal them physically in several decades, even if it extended to the courts of the European Union, so to say. So what I'm saying here that many of these deeds, misdeeds, would be unpunished. So and this justice would not be met in many cases. How could we deal with this? Uh, it, it depends. So uh, at that moment we have more than 100,000 of criminal proceedings uh, related to the war crimes committed in Ukraine. But uh, we can prioritize them. For example, if Russian soldiers stole uh, alcohol from the supermarket, it is a war crime. But if he raped a four years girl, it is also a war crime. So, and with 100,000 of criminal proceedings is a some of all criminal proceedings. So we have to prioritize them according to our values. Human dignity goes first. And alcohol from supermarket, okay, we can skip it. Thank you so much. Pane Jaroslave, uh, this I've been told that IT, uh, IT industry in Ukraine was probably the most resilient one. Uh, and probably in the, in the last year it probably brought some profits to the economy. Not this year, probably stations that rated, but still, for many of us, IT sector is a kind of a symbol of resilience. How would it look like after the war? Could we, say, uh, uh, develop on, on, on this particular IT, IT, IT sector, especially if you want to go into, say, the post-industrial post, post world? Uh, thank you, Yaroslav. Just adding to the uh, Svetlana's point, so these uh, 100,000 crimes uh, were kind of documented mostly because of technology, because there are much more technology now, video, uh, photos, uh, uh, intersect of communication that helps uh, to, 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 to document this. So I don't know if there are any chance if IT can help to uh, make this pr process of uh, Core decisions easier the, uh, after after for 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 for, for, fi uh, for prosecuting those uh, at least to find them. Let's keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, if talking about IT, of course, even uh, if if talk about uh, this support of our government, uh, so in a great extent, 
it, it is because of the services our government uh, provided uh, through uh, this DIA smartphone application. Because uh, first of all, the number of users of that uh, application increased uh, a lot during uh, this full, uh, full scale invasion. That means they, they were able to, to find uh, some services like uh, to, 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 to receive some money, some social transfers through that uh, app. Uh, to, to find uh, their documents, because sometimes people lost their paper documents, but uh, they were able to requ recover them uh, through this digital mean. Uh, some services about damaged property, so now you can make photos of your damaged property and report it uh, for future repayment or even some current repayment uh, as well. So, and all these services, uh, you can even play a game as a uh, Bayraktar uh, pilot, say, uh, or, or operator to, 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 to uh, throw their bomb to, to some Russian uh, tank. So, um, oh, unfortunately, oh, offline. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, so uh, th uh, that means that government was very close to, 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 to every person uh, who uses uh, application and in, it indeed helped uh, to, to, to make the bridge uh, between Ukrainians who never believe in their government and the government. Uh, and I believe that this service, uh, this kind of unique service for the world uh, will be uh, widely used in other countries. Uh, I was on, on a conference about DIA and uh, to my best knowledge, many countries, for example, Estonia already adopted. Uh, many Afri African countries are in the line to, 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 to be able to adopt this uh, application. So uh, that talking means- about DIA. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that means that uh, we are on a right uh, stage with GauTech technologies. So uh, how, Gau uh, how we can use technology to, to, how can government use technology to help uh, citizens and how citizens can communicate with governments through uh, those means. Uh, of course, uh, this war is uh, the most technological war uh, of, uh, of the history. And uh, we see how technology adapts almost every day. And uh, in Ukraine, a Ukrainian uh, Ukrainians have this unique situation when they can kind of test these iterations of, of, of some technologies uh, in the real time. So you don't need to wait, uh, you need to, to go somewhere to test, so you can test it immediately. And uh, it, it, it brings uh, attention to a lot of uh, producers of military equipment and they see Ukraine as a future Miltech uh, industry leader. Uh, there are a lot of information uh, wars happening in social media, uh, not only in social media, also cybersecurity. And here, uh, as uh, one of my friends said, uh, the quote of Mike Tyson is very good. It's, you have the plan until you had a fast punch in your mouth. <laughs> yeah? And this is about many cybersecurity specialists and the best. Yeah? So they can recommend a lot, but they never faced uh, such aggression, such intensive uh, uh, cybersecurity uh, threats. So uh, that makes our specialists uh, as the superheroes. Uh, and here again, we can think about uh, leading uh, in cyber world uh, uh, in the future, and also about this fake news uh, and uh, how, how to slow down them, how to detect them. Uh, it's not only news, it's not about information, but it's about uh, audio, video. Uh, so there are a lot of advances in what's called deep fakes. Now, and again, Ukraine uh, are leaders in creating such technologies, I should say. Reface is one of the leading companies, Ukrainian startup is one of the leading uh, uh, startups in face modification, say, 
بزنس ريسبيتشر زي كان موديفاي يور فويس فور اكزامبل يو يو كان توك از بريزيدنت اوف ذا يونايتد ستيتس اي دونت هاف انتنشن تو دو Uh, so there are a lot of developments. Uh, it, that means that uh, the IT business will change because currently, for the last 10, 15, 20 years, it was mostly outsourcing business. When we take some orders from the West and uh, do services for them, so uh, much less product development. But now all these areas, these are product developments. So we will be the owners of this technology and it can be really good start for for our product development IT business if i if i may ask i know that it sector was planning to make the shift to outsourcing to 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 produce the original products it was planned before the war so what you're saying that war has changed that or this is like a new 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 phase yeah intensity we, yeah so we, we can't just say that this is bad and this is good so mm -hmm. Outsourced business is also a good business model, and we are champions uh, here, jointly with India. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, but what we are able to do with our talents, we are able to do much more. So and so, before this full-scale invasion, so many thought about two competing IT sectors. Outsourcing sectors will remain, but uh, it requires a lot of resources. Uh, people resources in product development you you require less people but more talent so it should be extra superheroes that can do something in a small team but that can be uh, sold everywhere in the world yeah so and this uh, I don't we're not take soul uh, philosophy is about product development so this is really issue of the breakthrough of Ukraine you say one of the main break breakthrough yeah yeah Uh, in uh, in our uh, dean's in dean's office of applied sciences, there is a portrait of Andrian Slavotsky and his phrase uh, that when we will have three to five uh, IT guys that will make a really worldwide IT product, then the world will hear about Ukraine. Unfortunately, world heard about Ukraine because of the war, but I hope that uh, they will uh, hear about us. Uh, also as uh, great IT producers. Thank you, Panoslava, you made my day. <laughs> Thank you. Panatras, I mean, one of the main resources of Ukraine is spirituality. And this is not just pathetic words, it's true. We envisage on every everyday level. And I also believe that, I mean, it's not a belief, it's a kind of common knowledge that throughout the war, Ukraine has went through the large transformation. First of all, uh, we shifted to a new, new calendar which is really kind of one, one for 100 years change. Then we have one church, which Moscow Patriarchate, which dom has dominance has been, so to say, undermined. And this provides a new model, because basically in Orthodox world, because the, for the first time, not for, for the first time, but one of the first time, we have the, the really kind of the church, which is, which is uh, not related to the state directly, so to say. This kind of the under undermining of the political model so to say. So what I'm saying here, I believe that probably this is the most, the, the main, the main not achievement, but the main change, the transformation in Ukraine that went is the kind of spiritual uh, tra tra transformation. Uh, many says, and I, uh, I would share this kind of uh, uh, conclusion that now what we have in Ukraine, some kind of epistemological breakthrough, which is uh, related to the spirituality as well. So what is your take on, the, on, the, on this kind of stage and on the future? of Ukraine in this in this kind of dimension. <coughs> yeah, I think uh, what you describe as as a spiritual resurgence is really more um, an open end story. Nobody knows what to do with that. There is much more on the demand side of it than on the <laughs> uh, offer proposition uh, side. And I don't think any any established church organization knows how to respond to a to the crisis which is already here and which is ensuing with the psychological trauma and fam broken families broken ties replaced displaced people and so on uh, so 
and also we don't know how to deal with uh, increasing demand for for answers uh, what people uh, who sur who went through existential very deep in existential situation of death and uh, l loss of very close friends risk of their own death and so on they will come i think from the war and we all as a society will emerge out of this war with much more demand in religion than the any church will be uh, prepared to satisfy and that's that's a huge huge question i already heard some people speculating about it uh, and searching for answers uh, like what to do with uh, for example with the neo paganism which is extremely popular and extremely lively, prolific, energetic, especially among uh, very uh, passionate people who are like fighters and uh, many soldiers. Um, my son visited several weeks ago. Uh, he went with his friends to the front lines as bringing goods to the soldiers, and he visited a battalion of Sheikh Mansur, which is a Chechen Muslim battalion <coughs> sorry and uh, he said uh, that well there is a colonel of chechen fighters of course there but there are many many young ukrainians who converted to islam why because uh, they th perceived christianity as kind of meshy uh, pacifistic thing uh, s secondly they saw in those uh, th this this huge uh, very strong combination of uh, passionate religion with passionate warrior spirit in especially among uh, the Chechens who who went already through several wars with Russians and uh, this all is just open problems how we will deal with this but my maybe I will turn a little bit to more positive side is that um, one of the strongest points of religion is that we deal not so much with ideas, but with person. And uh, with all due respect to, to our academic context that we, yeah, we are people who have to deal with ideas, we have to, to develop ideas, we have to develop strategies, we have to do everything uh, in the world of uh, concepts. But at the same time, we have not to be blind uh, to, to persons in need, and uh, we have not to, to use uh, our High flying, you know, engagements with with ideas, with uh, great concepts, uh, as an excuse for ignoring uh, people who will be uh, very much in need. So I think this will be one of more probably strong points where Christianity, Catholicism, uh, and this university can display itself as as a useful fourth force in the society. Uh, if we try to help people who are, especially uh, soldiers who return, who are wounded, psychologically, uh, depressed, uh, and so on. And maybe we should not also um, cultivate the feeling of guilt, because I, I, there was already this discussion between uh, people who were mentioned here, who are Western ex experts and who uh, speculate about the post-war trauma on the material of uh, veterans from Afghanistan and Iraq and Vietnam and so on. And people like Oksana Zabushko, maybe he, she is not right, maybe she is right. She says, forget about this model. Uh, because if you are too attached to this model of guilt and trauma, you kind of undermine the, the reality that these guys here, they are heroes. They, they defended their country they they have to be proud they don't have to be ashamed because they they did not take part in the uh, aggression against other countries as there was a case justified or not justified i'm not saying now uh, with iraq afghanistan vietnam they 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 fought on their own ground and of course it doesn't change human physiology or or psychology in terms of trauma but if we speak too much as a society uh, about them as victims of war or about them as as being even guilty because they have blood on their hands or something it's really it really affects the psychology of the soldiers much worse than we would uh, look at them as heroes or 
I wish Oksana Zabushko would write, would be right, but I know, I mean, it's not just about the, the, the Iraq or whatever, but this kind of general rule about uh, people coming from the war, for the facing violence, all the kind of things. This is, this is, a, this is the issue. Uh, so I, I know I don't have any answer. Yeah. Because I, what, what I just told, be prepared. Be sure, prepared. That, sure. That's, a, that's the, the, the common, the common advice. Be prepared. Think about the better scenario, but be prepared for the worse. Yeah, but I, I, I wanted to add uh, also that uh, that we need to be prepared that people would bring from the war very different stories. And unfortunately, you already have some stories. This is this is already reality. They will, uh, they will have, but they will tell the stories if uh, they will see that we are ready to hear them. No, yeah. I'm, I'm talking. I'm, I have some front lines. I won't get into details because they are now leaning with the people who return from the war is in their family or as the neighbors. And I hate to say, but it's not the best experience to say. Not because they're bad, better good people, but because they returned from the war. So this is what I'm telling this. Again, this is a trauma of the war. It's not, it doesn't say anything good or bad about us. It says the, that this is war, and the war is very bad things. It's traumatized everyone. Uh, so uh, if I may return to our main topic, Panatarasa, Ukrainian, was or is one of the best educated nations in the world, judging by many criteria. I mean, this is a study by Pew, the international uh, uh, group, and they say basically that Ukrainians and Moldavians nowadays in Europe, in, in Europe is one of the, has the highest rate of the students or the people among the young age with the university diploma. I'm not talking about the quality, I'm talking about the numbers. But in any case, I believe education is a very much is very important asset for Ukraine. So my question is exactly to to your field as a rector of this university, so to say. What kind of changes do we see in this field during the war? Are there positive changes, and what would we do to make them sustainable? Um, thank you for your question. Uh, maybe before I move to answer it directly, so I would like to mention. Uh, one important thing for me, it's my conviction that the main source of Ukraine's resilience is the Ukrainian people. So Taras was saying about this grassroots solidarity mm -hmm. and uh, initiative. And uh, I think that uh, all of us feel that somehow our hope is in the fact that Ukrainians made existential choice to be, to exist as a nation, to exist as an independent state. And everything else comes, I think, from this really fundamental decision, which we f feel not only in you know, the resistance of our uh, armed, force, armed forces and our, uh, our people, ordinary people as well, but we also feel it in the fact that we perhaps we cannot articulate you know what's ukrainian dream you know for the next generation but we know and we feel that ukrainians think about future so they are not locked or closed off in the past so they use their past somehow to shuffle it to transform it but in their thinking ahead, you know, really what to do. And I think education is really helpful in it because education and universities especially are um, those institutions, those engines that should, you know, formulate the vision of the future and give hope and also help uh, in this sense to solve some issues like a uh, brain drain because we understand that uh, people who uh, went abroad so they will be coming home if they feel, if they see that the country has an articulation of, of, its, uh, of its future. Of course, you know, education could be, as you said, already bad and could be good. And we also see on the example of Russia, which seemed also to be statistically quite uneducated like formally educated nation, but it collapsed actually into this barbarity. 
and education uh, followed you know this collapse and maybe even uh, even in some sense intensified it you know i was uh, just struck uh, by the fact that i don't remember 700 or 800 you know rectors in march 2022 of russian universities they signed in support of of the war it was a scandal so and Academy of Science too. So it was a it was a scandal because you know where is critical thinking? Where is uh, a commitment to freedom, academic freedom, to to democratic values and uh, just civility, just normal, just basic, you know, civility. So, but uh, I think that in in, U in Ukraine, uh, education should play. Uh, and by education, I mean also research, and Yaroslav was saying about research, should play a prominent role in Ukraine's future. So the problems will be immense that you know we will come across, we will face uh, after the war. And uh, uh, it's no wonder that so many people keep talking, you know, how to uh, how to ensure victory after the victory because we have we will have problem of people from the occupied territories uh, and uh, the, the big question how to establish trusted institutions there and really to distinguish between those who are collaborate uh, like you know, voluntary collaborators or involuntary collaborators and other issues uh, so we, we will have a really demographic crisis and uh, we will uh, we will need we, we should be three times more productive and how it could come true i think education should change and somehow to contribute to it in different ways even by changing you know its pedagogical means i mean introducing more project based learning or uh, service learning as a part of the educational experience and actually as part of acquiring knowledge and skills and attitudes so we will face you know big issue of the mental gap between you know it was also mentioned already between those who uh, were living and staying close to the front line those who uh, became IDPs those who are in the in the uh, back line and those who left uh, the country and uh, didn't come back. And there will be a, a kind of a need for uh, finding some kind of unity. And also when the war will be over, after the victory, the politics will come back normally because we, <clears throat> we have to have politics. We have to have a discussion. Mm -hmm. We have to have uh, conversation and but also controversy mm -hmm. you know if you want to envisage a better uh, future for the people and uh, and for the country and the question remains but in despite you know all this controversy and uh, difference will we be able to maintain this fundamental unity which is important for the flourishing of the country and i think universities could be helpful in contributing because universities by definition they are platform of meet of meeting between different let's say parties not only in political sense but different social actors and for discussion and for argument and for good argument you know Very so good point. so this is this is this is our role and um, and uh, and i think that also what's what's important is we, we didn't talk much about it, but uh, Ukraine's flourishing and sustainability, sustainable development uh, will depend a lot on the basic security. So we, we have to achieve it. And uh, whether we want it or not, it will depend this basic security not only on us and our effort. It should be international. You know effort and um, I think it's important uh, to keep uh, fighting the, uh, the battle of wills I mean fighting for uh, uh, public opinion in the West to remain to remain beneficial for Ukrainians to explain what's what's going on and to fight different uh, you know, Russian 
Russian propaganda, which, among other things, would like to convince us that uh, kind of Russia is invincible, and Russia in the war of uh, attrition will uh, uh, will uh, unavoidably uh, win, and uh, somehow to that that Russia, as if Russia will be able to endure more pain, you know, than all other countries uh, together, and will be more resilient than uh, anybody anybody else so we have we have to show that you know russia it's a uh, or you know putin's regime it's really a, a regime which is which aims at you know pure destruction and it must be stopped by international community but it's important that we should win uh, all the time public opinion and uh, because lincoln said public opinion is everything so and universities here should play their role as well. So to not only to sustain, to make sustainable uh, the interest in Ukraine and to keep explaining Ukraine to a broader uh, international community, not only in Europe or uh, in um, North America, but you know going farther, you know to uh, Latin America, to to Africa, to Asia. So, but also. We, we we have we have to uh, we have uh, besides explaining Ukraine we really have to explain that there is no reason to fear Russia to be afraid of Russia and I think this is contribution also of uh, of U the, of Ukrainians to the world. Thank you so much. So my last question last question starts when the Pantarazas finished. So what role? Our university, the Ukrainian Catholic University, has to play, in your opinion, this transformation for resilience to sustainability. I know you'll have a, your lecture, inauguration lecture in two days. So you could give us a very short version of it <laughs> right now. I know you. this is, will be a main topic of the address to First of all, we should remain. We, we, we were, we are, and we should remain part of the Ukrainian people, and to feel, you know, uh, to feel kind of the wave, to feel it, you know, from within, to respond to the needs uh, that and to the challenges uh, uh, that uh, are in the present situation. In this sense, uh, we talk uh, here at our university uh, about the mission. Uh, to to heal the wounds, uh, the trauma uh, of the war, and in different ways through you know improving our programs in rehabilitation, through opening um, new programs for uh, for veterans for their reintegration into uh, life and for their flourishing, and many other things, we should make our generous contribution uh, to. Uh, to the recovery of the country, to the modernization and development, sustainable development of the country. And uh, this should be done uh, already, already Metro mentioned how important the decentralization reform is and how important it is to strengthen uh, and to build capacity of, uh, of our local communities. And this is very much in tune with also uh, the social uh, church social teaching about subsidiarity that people should be able to solve uh, the issues uh, of their ordinary life as close to where they live as possible not really you know looking for somebody uh, in the capital or even in the regional capital you know to do it and as I mentioned also we have to uh, to sustain and develop even more interest for Ukraine in the world. And this means we have to be present on different international uh, platform, uh, platforms, different international discussions, and, uh, and develop uh, for this also different tools. Uh, we are a small university, uh, but our strength is in collaboration, in uh, strong partnerships with other universities, uh, which uh, could really enhance also our contribution and impact. 
Thank you so much. I would add the same question to each of our participants, but I would like to focus for a particular field. Mm -hmm. So to say, what is, what, how you envisage the role of your particular field with this university for this kind of transformation from, sus, for, for, from resilience to sustainability? May I start from the right to the left, Pantaras? But, but I will also, my field is philosophy. So yeah. philosophers should work on the level of the senses. So I think this is very important and we all feel that uh, that's because on the level of the senses we are all we are uh, we are uh, more than less you know all right this also contributes to our to our victory so i think you know the humanities in in general should be part of each of our program and really help to understand the most fundamental things about god about a human uh, life and human person Anthrop anthropology is very important. Thank you. I understand that you help a lot of us because now his, his answer will be probably much shorter. <laughs> well, I, still. I, I think I already mentioned some aspects of what how theology can be useful. Uh, and uh, excuse me, particular theology at Catholic University. At the I Catholic I? University, yes. Uh, um, I think um, there are many projects that we started before the war and which had kind of nation building uh, dimension. Uh, and uh, those projects have never been completed because some of them are really, really long term and some of them just have not been completed. And uh, we should continue with those. Uh, something like dear to my heart is uh, obviously um, a retranslation of the best of uh, the humanity into Ukrainian. Uh, something like starting with Homer and Plato, and uh, you know, obviously we cannot be the only place uh, in Ukraine who do that. There should be a whole network of intellectual uh, environments, intellectual circles who who do it w from Greek, from Latin, from other languages, uh, and also uh, really classical research from other uh, modern nations, from English, from French, from from German. That's one wing of what we should be doing, re-translating, re re, um, I would say relocating knowledge from one place to the other because translation is never, sometimes people have this very naive uh, understanding of translation that it is simply uh, like uh, passing something from one language to the other, but it's really not because once you translate this uh, very fundamental text, it, you really create intellectual no sphere in 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 the Ukrainian to to be for, and circles of people able operate those ideas. So this is really uh, a growth of the national um, spirit and national consciousness and and intellect. But obviously this would not be enough because we need also to be creative. And uh, I already hear many voices from people from theology, from philosophy, from other uh, disciplines that um, we should not be just looking back or looking upwards, uh, like from, from uh, low level to uh, up to other nations who are obviously much more advanced, like Germans or, or the English-speaking world, uh, because the experience we are going through now uh, can give such an impulse to thinking, to 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 not just speculations, but really profound existential uh, processing of what is going on, and that can be uh, can be very fruitful for the European civilization as such. Because if we are in the front lines of physical fight and in the front line of resilience, uh, then probably we can also be at least partially in the front, in the intellectual front line, in the spiritual front line of uh, the modern world. And that's what we should try oh, to do, inspire to do. Thank you. I strongly support this. Uh, okay, I'm here as a representative uh, of Faculty of Health Sciences. So it means uh, that our main uh, efforts since the beginning of war and now now is just intensified because before before the war we also uh, do a lot uh, to uh, 
uh, to create the best possible options for people to get uh, a good uh, rehabilitation services, a good psychological services, you know, social support, and etc. And also, I think that it's very important not just to in our field of help people uh, not just to create good professionals but to create good professional teams because we know that people who suffer and who need healing they need a lot of help different help not only with physical help or psychological or social it's so 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 good uh, good strong teams it's uh, uh, very uh, good idea and worth our efforts and uh, as our faculty we have a good experience through this two years uh, of this team and I think that we can proceed uh, with this and preparing and, and the last point um, I would like to mention that I sometimes think that Ukrainians uh, suffer uh, so much pain and so much uh, it's a very hard experience that now they uh, they deserve the best services. So it's something that motivates uh, me and my colleagues to do uh, best we can. Thank you so much. This field. Thank you, Pani Yaroslava. I know you're changing your heads nowadays. So what what kind of hat you would like to have, or probably both? Answer this question: IT or? Uh, I'll talk more generally. Okay. Yeah. That, uh, so, to be real silent, as uh, Dmitro already said, and there are a lot of books uh, are written about that, is to have access resources. If you have access resources, then we are more stable and more resilient. Uh, we will need military resources, and hopefully, our friends will 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 supply them, and we also recover from uh, our uh, industry, military industry to produce more. We'll need financial resources. And again, our friends, uh, G7 and others, hopefully will provide those resources, uh, including uh, resources from uh, Russian Federation that will be uh, directed uh, to uh, recovery and rebuilding of Ukraine, modernization of Ukraine. Uh, from what I heard from Taras, uh, both Taras's, uh, uh, we will need access of our spiritual well-being, uh, senses, resources, say. And this is something where our university uh, can play uh, really uh, one of the first roles uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. We'll need unity resources. So this is the resource that is... Uh, we, we have a full of unity resources when we have a lot of danger around. But uh, we kind of lack these resources when everything is OK uh, us. Just remember uh, Tuzla case, uh, not in our history, yeah? So this there, are, was... there are many young people who don't, don't, don't know. They will probably be born this year, so they have no <laughs> knowledge about Tuzla. Yeah. So th that was another uh, time when we supported our government, yeah. by the way. Th yeah. Uh, and one of the biggest and most needed resources we'll have is human capital. Uh, this is about all other things, by the way. Uh, and I think this is probably will be our primary role uh, to, to maintain, to grow, uh, not our, but all these young uh, ladies and gentlemen here. Uh, who probably uh, spend their first day uh, at UKU just enrolling to, 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 to UKU programs. Uh, and that means both education, it means uh, research, and that means service. Mm -hmm. And this is what, what we, uh, UKU is all about. Thank you so much. If I may, just very briefly, I would like to reinforce Taras's point mm -hmm. with one interesting story. It was from March 2022. I saw the post of a soldier on Facebook speaking about Natalia Yakovenko. So it was still, you know, uh, the risk of occupation for Kyiv. And she was speaking, Natalia Yakovenko is a famous Ukrainian historian. And she was at that point translating Titus Livius, so his, uh, his books into Ukrainian. And the soldier said, this is what we are fighting for. 
So I think this is a kind of very important you know, message. Indeed, indeed. And uh, shall I speak from perspective of the outreach and uh, international relations? Uh, but actually, I will touch upon a little bit the our our game here inside of Oku because uh, let us be frank. So the war is going on; it's not finished, and it will not be finished when we have the ceasefire. And that's practically means that we are sitting here smiling in beautiful like t-shirts or whatever, just because our soldiers are fighting right now and will be fighting in the next week. So. Our task is to do our homework. I mean, supporting them, supporting whatever we can do as university to actually to win. And after that, to modernize ourselves. So our first prime mission is to help to win. And by helping to win, I not only mean like helping physically, because some of the students and our faculty members in our community are already on the front line doing that job, uh, some of them have already died so uh, because they were killed. So they don't die, they were killed. So that's important. So we should keep that in, in our mind for every day. And we should transform this understanding into some practical deeds. If university can consult, it should consult. If university and somebody is needs a help, I mean, local communities, business, civic organizations, NGOs, whatever, we should provide this consultancy and help. I like that idea that was talked about that university uh, will play a role of calming down people because it's a natural like pound for discussion. I, I, I think that's quite important, that we need to bring our ideas, our disputes here, and, the, and in atmosphere, when we can rely on science, we should debate with each other, just simply coming down. And we should bring different people, not only who are students, but who are outside of university, your parents, for example, adults, come in here and the, in atmosphere when they have, can rely on science coming down and finding this proper way. So this is, this is basically our homework. But also we should take responsibility, because we were talking about like a number of different risks. We were talking about solidarity and resilience. But this is, we have positive negative solidarity. And we, we have these witnesses of solidarity of being suspicious to the other, solidarity in finding some ways of somebody who is not proper, so some, somebody who is outsider, and we, we like to play this ostracism games. So there is a number of different challenges within the negative solidarity, and we should we should find a way how to how to keep this solidarity in the positive sense. But also, it's important that we will find uh, we should take responsibility for promoting Ukraine. Uh, we were touching the idea of the global south that still so-called global south. I don't like the specific meaning, but at least so so-called this global south that have these anti-Western narratives. And we should keep in mind that we are the best right now. We are Europeans, we are the best. We are representatives to global south, to the number of these societies and countries what they, about what they're thinking about Europeans, of these colonizers, white guys and white girls. So, and we should do our best, like not only to inform, and but to persuade them that this European narrative and Ukrainian narrative is not about colonization, it's, it's not about what they expected from West to be, but also showing them the new West. So I, I don't have the clear vision of this new West, so probably like uh, humanities should create this idea of what, what is gonna be the new West. Ukraine was for a long period of time something in between. Now we have the splendid opportunity to say, no, we are the best in country. And I admire that. So, but what will be the face of this new Western country? That, that's actually quite a good question, that your generation, the generation of the young people here should, should create. And finally, we should not forget that this is also war, not only about our personal security and our personal country, but this is war about uh, between democracy and autocracy. And I hear, I always come into the idea that there is index of democracy that was performed by the uh, Economist uh, Research Union in 2006. 
and they showed that uh, at that period of time of 2006, there were almost 30% of autocracies in the world. And now this number is growing to 40%, almost 40% of autocracies in the world. So we don't know what will be the future of the world. Probably this could be a world with a number of autocracies that are just now waiting for the results of Ukraine and Russian war. Sure. And we have some somehow find a way to, to deal with it, not losing our democracy that we need still to build, but also working or not working with this autocracy. So this is, this is a fundamental question, how we should transform our, our behavior. So uh, we should take responsibility because U Ukraine, uh, you know, as uh, Volodymyr Turchinovsky liked to, to say that this, we are actually the, uh, the, the social transformation laboratory. And we had experience, whatever you wish, like civic conflicts inside of Ukraine, the number of wars, uh, ecological catastrophes, so whatever you can imagine at the major global humanity crisis, we have already experienced in our, in our history, so we have some answers. And we should make these answers really smart and take personal responsibilities to bring these answers to the questions that the world right now is asking us to do. Excellent, excellent. Pani uh, Svetlana. Thanks. So uh, I'm agree with my colleagues that there is a lot of work to do for us, uh, but I would like to pay attention to one temptation. And there is a temptation to, for us as a university to try to save the world. And it's good aspiration, but on the other hand, we have to focus, as, at least I think so, on our key target audience, which is present here, on our students. Our key task is to prepare them to restart Ukraine and to save the world. It requires from us to work, to work hard, but also it requires on us, which is even more difficult, uh, some kind of humility and patience. We, we, will, we have to take responsibility for their future mistake and maybe one day we will be blessed to witness their success and to share with them their success. And this is, I think it's very important for us as a university. And speaking about law school, we can contribute at least three things. First of all, we have to rethink legal profession in Ukraine because as law school graduates have to be uh, intellectually independent they have to be aware of their impact on society and be able to manage this impact and to bear responsibility. Second thing, we have to shift from teaching uh, how to apply the law to uh, building their capacity to design a legal solution for difficult problems. And this requires a completely different mind science, uh, mindset. And it brings me to the, my final point that um, we have to teach values, not in a sophisticated way, but in as a practical means. Because in a situation of complete uncertainty, uh, values become the only reliable things to find a solution for difficult unknown problems. And that's why values should be the essence of our studies. And speaking about legal uh, values, uh, we have to keep in mind that all of them are uh, embedded in Christi Christian ethics, and we have to remember this. And my like, final remarks is, uh, as Ukrainians, we uh, give a good example to the West and the rest of the world what is worth to live for, what is worth to fight for, and what is worth even to die for. Thank you so much. I believe it's a very good conclusion. Values matter. And since Ukrainian Catholic University is the university that provides education with the values, Ukrainian Catholic University matters. So on this note, I would like to thank you, to thank all our Presenters here, the members are discussion for the thoughts. I believe we have something food to, to, to think about. So let us give us our sincere applause.
And thanks for moderator for putting out these questions and you for listening us. Yeah. And, thank, and, thanks, and thanks for all the people who make the things happen. I don't know the list, the list is very long. But again, again, let me support, let me again, thanks for the general support of this event, a series of events, the British Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Commonwealth. Thank you. Thank you.